Welcome to the On Medical Grounds podcast. I'm Jill Sellers, your host. On Medical Grounds is a casual, friendly place where you can find an authentic, audible blend of timely, scientific, and medical knowledge. We talk with experts about their experiences and knowledge, the utilization of new therapies, and challenges within the world of healthcare. Select podcasts offer continuing medical education credits for those of you needing an additional why you should listen. We provide perks to all posted podcasts by linking content so you can drink in more if you so choose. Welcome to part two of the On Medical Grounds podcast on respiratory syncytial virus, otherwise known as RSV. Many of you may be aware by now that RSV is on the rise around the globe during a season in which we normally do not see it. This is a winter virus, not a summer virus. This discussion will focus on the available diagnostic tools developments on the horizon to protect against the virus, and how RSV impacts older adults. Our first guest today is Dr. Jonathan Tempty, who is Associate Dean for Public Health and Community Engagement at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health, where he also serves as Professor of Family Medicine and Community Health. Dr. Tempty was the first family practice physician to serve on and chair the U.S. Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. He currently chairs the Wisconsin Council on Immunization Practices, is a member of the CDC's Board of Scientific Counselors, and is the AAFP representative on the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices COVID-19 Vaccine Workgroup. Dr. Tempty is the principal investigator in multiple studies and has been very involved with the COVID-19 response at local, state, and national levels. I will link to a more complete bio of Dr. Tempty in the show notes. Welcome to the On Medical Grounds podcast, Dr. Tempty. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Well, I am looking forward to this discussion, and I'm going to jump right in with some of my questions. So how serious is RSV, and does it often go undetected or overlooked when trying to make a diagnosis? Well, the easy answer to that second question is yes, we oftentimes don't even consider this as a possibility. We usually think of RSV as a significant disease of infants and young children, but it is also a very significant pathogen for older adults and those with underlying pulmonary conditions. It contributes to thousands of pediatric hospital admissions every year and now is increasingly recognized as a driver of hospitalizations and death in elders and in people with underlying COPD and asthma. And I have to mention that outbreaks of RSV in long-term care facilities are common and result in increased morbidity and mortality. My research and surveillance team conducts studies in primary care settings, in long-term care facilities, and in schools. And I've been struck by how common RSV is across the entire age spectrum. Now, in terms of our detection, we do very little testing on average in primary care, in long-term care, and in other settings. And our testing is usually dependent on the age, situation, and place. And I would say that most commonly we do testing for ill infants at the time of hospital admission. It's occasionally done for hospitalized patients, particularly as part of a respiratory panel, but Testing for RSV is rarely done in the ambulatory setting. Interesting. How does the presentation of RSV differ in a pediatric patient versus a middle-aged patient versus an older adult patient? Well, I'll have to confess that early on in our surveillance program, I was struck by a woman in her 30s who presented primarily with a sore throat, and it turned out to be RSV. And that has led me down the line of really paying attention to what we see. We typically think of RSV in infants as rhinorrhea with cough. And oftentimes I describe this to my residents as being the green 11 sign, where you have thick, copious nasal discharge coming out of both nostrils. But oftentimes with other people, we'll find, you know, a milder illness in older children, healthy adults, and then exacerbations of asthma and COPD in older adults. So it kind of runs the whole spectrum of a respiratory virus uh, with a multitude of symptoms. 
So what are some of the common methods of testing for and diagnosing RSV? Are they the same in all those populations or do they vary depending on the patient? They vary depending on the patient, the age, and the setting. But the common tests out there are reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, rapid molecular testing, direct fluorescent antibody testing, and rapid antigen testing. In the past, we used to use culture, but this is a technique that is rarely used anymore. But again, I think the important concept of our to, to carry across here is testing is often dependent on the location. And so, for example, with an infant admitted to a hospital, we largely rely on polymerase chain reaction testing. And on outpatient settings where they're used, we can use the rapid molecular and the rapid antigen testing. And are those relatively easy, the, the rapid tests? Are those relatively easy to use? In general, they are very easy to use. They tend to be CLIA wave tests, and they tend to be fairly straightforward tests to conduct. But the important thing is first acquiring a, a respiratory specimen and this is actually pretty easy. We use nasal swabs, nasal pharyngeal swabs, or nasal aspirates. And in general, these are samples that are easy and very safe to collect. When we talk about these tests and these methods of testing, which of them are more accurate and reliable? Like, I know that you've said it depends on the patient and the setting and then do, are there certain tests that are used in certain settings that are more accurate and reliable than others? A absolutely. So the clear winner for accuracy is the PCR-based tests. These have the highest sensitivity and specificity. However, and this is an important consideration, these tests are not easily available in outpatient settings, and they require time for you know specimen transfer, for testing and reporting. And so it really depends on the situation. Do I need the answer quickly or can I wait for a few hours? And typically with a hospital admi admission, we have time on our hand because our treatments are supportive. We don't have any definitive treatment for respiratory syncytial virus and that patient isn't going anywhere. On the other hand, in a primary care setting, once that patient episode is done, and I have a result coming in, it requires me to locate the patient, communicate with the patient, get the information across. And if something comes back to me three or four hours later, it really represents a pain that I have to deal with. And so we really like the rapid tests uh, in settings where they can be used rapidly. And I'm going to just divert a little bit here. We did a study looking at rapid influenza testing in long-term care facilities. And even though the rapid flu test has a lower sensitivity than the PCR, the rapidity of resulting allowed facilities to respond much more quickly to outbreak situations. And so I think it's really, really important to kind of carry across. It depends on the location, depends on the need for timing, and it depends on who you're looking at. But there's no difference in the accuracy and reliability of the rapid test versus the longer term when you have more time test, correct? Well, the, the PCR tests clearly have a higher sensitivity and specificity, and we're willing to trade some of that away with the more rapid tests in clinical settings. Okay. And so in general, the rapid tests have a lower sensitivity and oftentimes a lower specificity, but the specificities are usually very, very high. Okay. Understood. What are the current CDC guidelines and health department reporting requirements regarding RSV? Well, in general, there is no mandatory reporting of RSV. And the exception may be an outbreak in a long-term care facility or a hospital. But unlike a number of our other respiratory pathogens, such as SARS-CoV-2, measles, diphtheria, pertussis, chickenpox, RSV is not reportable. And so it kind of fits into that same class as influenza. Uh, influenza is only reportable if there's a laboratory-confirmed pediatric death. But so 
we don't have good ways of tracking RSV because of that lack of reporting. How has the emergence of COVID-19 changed the diagnosis and treatment of RSV, or, or has it? Well, first and foremost, there are no specific treatments for RSV. Basically, our approach in the inpatient setting is supportive, and this has not changed over decades. Okay. In the outpatient setting, the most important thing with RSV is the recognition and the anticipatory guidance and education of patients. So the COVID-19 pandemic hasn't changed anything along that line. However, one of the amazing things with this pandemic has been the fact that our public health interventions, our masking, distancing, hand washing, and so on, has had a profound effect on RSV. RSV largely has disappeared because of these public health interventions. And this has been really educational uh, to, to me and to other clinicians because we see the incredible effect that we can have with these non-pharmacologic measures out there. On the flip side, what we're seeing as we relax these measures is a resurgence of RSV. And I have to mention, I just got an email this morning from a colleague in Australia uh, with a preprint attached showing that in Australia, as the public health measures were relaxed, they experienced a great resurgence of RSV. So this is something that we have to keep in mind as we're hopefully in the next months coming out of this pandemic. But, but I think the, the other, other thing out there that's really important for our guests is the fact that as we're coming out of this pandemic and we're seeing resurgence of other respiratory pathogens, this is going to be incredibly, incredibly confusing for clinicians, and it's going to be a source of worry for patients. And I say this simply because as we're seeing uh, the presence of the Delta variant, and increased transmissibility of COVID. And if this is happening at the same time that we see other respiratory pathogens come back with a vengeance, people are gonna be confused as to what they have. Right. And this is gonna be really confusing for public health guidance. There's gonna be a lot of testing required and it's gonna be a chaotic time for several weeks to months. So if you had to look into that crystal ball for the future, um, based on what we know right now with COVID-19 and RSV, if the COVID-19 test was negative, what would be the next respiratory illness that would be tested for? Or what we're going to look to in the future, what do you think would be the next pro progression? Well, I think our biggest worry right now is that for a significant influenza outbreak, Okay. And I mention that simply because influenza, we do have vaccines that are effective, and we do have therapeutics that are effective if started early. So there are some of the rapid tests that are a dual uh, test for SARS and influenza. But I think we have to consider the whole gambit out there. And this really brings to bear the importance of having intact surveillance systems that can help let us know what's in circulation. For example, we're running a surveillance program on our university campus right now. And I can tell you that the people who are ill right now are ill with rhinovirus and with parainfluenza. Hmm. But unless you have the facility and the capability to test widely, you don't have that situational awareness. Right. That makes sense. So let's discuss some of the precautions taken to contain RSV once a patient has been diagnosed. We we discussed it a little bit earlier with the surgence of COVID-19 and how we haven't seen much RSV because of some things, but let's talk a little bit about those precautions taken to contain RSV. Well, I think it's important to understand that RSV is a virus that is shed for a longer period than things like influenza. And typically, 
we use uh, eight or nine days as the shedding period. But when we start looking at very young, so the infants or people who are immunocompromised, we can see shedding going on for uh, three to four weeks after initial infection. And this is really important because RSV can persist on surfaces and stay viable for hours to days. And so this is definitely a virus that can be easily spread by contact. Somebody coughs or sneezes on a surface. Hours later, somebody else comes along, wipes their hand and touches their nose or their eye. That can lead to transmission. And so in both hospital and ambulatory settings, right. it's really important if RSV is recognized to have that full contact precaution. This is the bane to, to my life when I'm doing inpatient attending because it requires gowning, gloving, uh, masking, uh, and eye protection. And then also uh, surface decontamination because we can easily spread this in a nosocomial fashion. So I think it's really important to just understand the dynamics of transmission here. It all goes back to let's wash our hands and take care of our personal hygiene, right? <laughs> that is so very, very important. And this is why we yeah. see uh, this incredible benefit of our public health measures during the pandemic. And we've seen not only effects on RSV and influenza, but virtually all the other respiratory viruses. How has the use of the device ID now impacted the diagnosis, treatment, and follow up in RSV patients? Well, the uh, ID now RSV test is one of the options for rapid RSV detection. And this is a molecular test. We see results within 15 minutes, and this has a higher sensitivity than the rapid antigen test. So, in my mind, the ideal settings for this type of test would be in an outpatient setting or uh, in a long-term care facility where having the result early can have incredible impact. In an outpatient setting, it provides me the ability to give results to worried parents quickly. Right. In a long-term care setting, I think more importantly, it allows those public health measures, the patient isolation, the contact uh, precautions and so on that are really essential to prevent this from spreading widely through a facility. You know, we've talked a lot about, you know, RSV, the disease, how it's transmitted, how it's diagnosed. It would be nice if we didn't even have to worry about it. So I know there are clinical trials ongoing with um, vaccines for RSV. And so I'm curious, once FDA approved, is the RSV vaccine one you would recommend to patients and which patient populations should get it without question and, and why? Well, this really depends on what the FDA licensure is for and what information the companies take forward for that licensure. But if I use my crystal ball, I can see certain targets out there that are going to be important. So currently we have no licensed vaccine, although there are several in the pipeline. Right. And when I look into the future, I think the targets out there are elders, people over the age of 65, adults with pre-existing medical conditions such as COPD or asthma, and trying to provide protection for infants. And for infants, it's a challenge because oftentimes vaccines are not terribly immunogenic in infants. So I think there's been a lot of work looking at the role of providing vaccine to pregnant women. So infants are born with maternal antibody in circulation. So it really depends on which vaccines are out there and what the licensure is for. But should a candidate become licensed and receive ACIP recommendation, I think it's going to be really, really important for individual and public health. And once it comes through ACIP, they have such a nice evidence-based recommendation process. Anything that they make a recommendation for, I would echo that strong recommendation for the indicated recipients. And then I think the important thing, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why podcasts like this are, are very important, 
This is going to require a great deal of education of clinicians and of patients, of mothers and others out there about the underlying nature of RSV disease and its significance. Agree. Education will be key for sure. Do you believe that the availability of an RSV vaccine will change how the disease is viewed? I I really think so. And again, I have to go back and look at colleagues in primary care across this country. And we all have a good sense of RSV, but our impressions are limited. We tend to think of RSV as that nasty virus that causes hospitalizations in infants. And I think we have to develop a broader perspective and see how this is an important disease across the age spectrum. And in particular, how it really not only affects the infants, but those older individuals with significant morbidity and mortality. Agree. We talked a little bit about COVID-19 and how it has changed some things with RSV detection and incidents, I guess. So in general, I can't let you go on this podcast without asking a general question. How has the, or or has the COVID-19 pandemic changed views towards testing and surveillance of infectious diseases? Yeah, I have to kind of go back to the comments I made before. And this has been an incredibly profound test case for what we do in public health. And the combined forces of school closure, physical distancing, masking, hand washing, has just had such an incredible reduction in respiratory viruses, including RSV. And I I dare say this has been very, very effective when used properly for COVID-19. But so I think that is the context of this whole pandemic. But the other thing when we talk about laboratory testing is the importance of ongoing surveillance as a tool for all of us for situational awareness, for both medical and public health personnel. If we can understand what pathogens are in circulation, at which time and who they're affecting, we can make much better decisions in terms of prevention, testing, response, and treatment. And and that's what we're here for, (laughs) to make these better decisions, right? To have a better, healthier public. Exactly. Our time is coming to a close. Do you have any final thoughts on what our audience should know and be aware of regarding RSV? Well, as I mentioned before, there have been very few changes in approach to RSV over decades. But the good news is our approach to RSV is likely to evolve rapidly in the next several years as we see new vaccines, new approaches to vaccines, and novel therapeutics. And we're really looking forward to the advent of safe and effective vaccines and other effective preventive and therapeutic options for individuals who are at high risk for morbidity and mortality. So I think I would say stay tuned, uh, keep that antenna up, looking for the newer developments in RSV. And, you know, Keep in mind that this is an important pathogen out there that we have to be aware of, especially as we start relaxing those measures for COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Tempty. This has been excellent. We appreciate you being our guest for the On Medical Grounds podcast. We especially appreciate your time educating us on RSV and all the work you are doing to move public health forward. Thank you so much. Well, and thank you so much for the opportunity today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Our second guest today is Dr. Angela Branch, an assistant professor at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and an infectious disease specialist from the University of Rochester Medical Center in New York. Dr. Branch received her Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Pennsylvania and her Doctor of Medicine degree from the American University of the Caribbean. She completed her residency in internal medicine at NYU Lutheran in Brooklyn, New York, and an infectious disease fellowship at the University of Rochester. Dr. Branch is board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases. Her current clinical practice is comprised of patients with general infectious diseases and HIV. I will link to a more complete bio for Dr. Branch in the show notes. Welcome to the On Medical Grounds podcast, Dr. Branch. Thank you. 
my primary clinical practice was with the geriatric population. Therefore, I have a keen interest in RSV and the elderly and the potential of it being overlooked when trying to make a diagnosis. So allow me just to jump in with my questions. How serious is respiratory syncytial virus in the elderly? And does it often go undetected or overlooked when trying to make a diagnosis? That's a great, those are great questions. So RSV was actually initially described as the cause of nursing home outbreaks and respiratory disease. It was first discovered in the 50s as something that caused illnesses in chimpanzees, actually. And then it became clear that it was something that was causing a lot of illness in children, especially young children under the age of two. Really severe bronchiolitis, lots of um, bronchitis and, and respiratory disease, and even potentially a trigger for things like asthma. And so for decades after its discovery, it was thought to be primarily a disease of childhood. In the late 80s and early 90s, some investigators, and in fact, some of them here at the University of Rochester, who were good colleagues, started to describe outbreaks in daycares and, and nursing home facilities of older adults that congregated in these settings. And since then, that's led to sort of national and international interests that RSV could, in fact, be a significant disease in adulthood. And who were the populations most affected? And now numerous studies uh, around the world have demonstrated that it is, in fact, something that we become periodically infected with throughout life. You do develop some immunity, but that immunity is partial, and it's really not enough to prevent you from getting reinfected. But for most of your adulthood, it'll just be a cold. Until you become somewhat older and you have some underlying medical conditions and you're a little bit more frail, and that's when having a cold is not just a cold. That's when having a cold can be bronchitis. It can cause exacerbations of heart failure and COPD. It can lead to pneumonia. It can lead to incapacity and weakness and, and worsening of frailty. And older adults um, very often will end up hospitalized with RSV infections. I don't think people are aware that RSV um, in older adults, the attack rates can actually exceed influenza in some seasons. And it can cause similar numbers of hospitalizations. And even in some seasons, RSV is the number one virus that's associated with hospitalizations in older adults. It can also be equally complicated by pneumonia um, and respiratory failure and, and the need for mechanical ventilation as what you might expect with flu. So if we're vaccinating older adults and, and really making sure that they're protected against influenza, we should also really be thinking about that with RSV. One of the reasons why it often goes undetected is that for a long time, people didn't understand that RSV was such a big player. But even with sort of better education and better knowledge, um, there's not a lot of um, desire or sort of um, push to test because we don't have treatments. And so because there's no treatment for RSV, there's really little motivation to make a diagnosis because treatment is just supportive and people just expect, oh, it's just another virus. Not yeah. true. And so RSV testing isn't always routinely performed and you really have to be thinking about RSV to test for it. So do you think most of the time because... It's not routinely thought of, and then it's not routinely tested for, it just goes overlooked. Yeah, I think there's a significant underdiagnosis of RSV okay. um, nationally and worldwide. We like to say that RSV has an identity problem because um, <laughs> people just, yeah. you know, they just say, well, you have a cold or you have another virus. You know, no, no, this person has RSV and it actually means something in this population. So, Right. Um, make a diagnosis, make sure that they're not spreading it around and, and be prepared to have to give a lot of supportive care because that's my, that might be what it takes in, in some vulnerable populations. So how does the presentation of RSV differ in an older adult patient than an infant? Again, RSV in childhood is, is recognized as this really significant disease because a lot of babies end up in the hospital and they have really severe bronchiolitis. And, you know, it's just a really scary thing that happens in early, early childhood, usually in infancy. And um, and so that sort of is, is all we hear about and really all that's recognized. But in fact, more adults are hospitalized and die from RSV every year than children, more adults over the age of 60. In adults, you'll often have like a really prolonged illness. It might start as a cold and then seven, 10 days later, you're not better. And then you really start to struggle to breathe and you end up in the hospital. And it turns out that now you have pneumonia 
or it's triggered hospitalizations because your heart failure or your emphysema has now been exacerbated and you're in the hospital for those. So that, that's how older adults present. Um, it's quite different than sort of the dramatic bronchiolitis picture of children, but it's in some, time, in some cases more deadly. It's very um, devastating because it does cause this tremendous loss of function um, in older adults. Let's discuss some of the common methods of testing for and diagnosing RSV. So do the testing methods differ depending on the age of the patient and which of these testing methods is more accurate and reliable? Absolutely. So um, some of the earlier tests for RSV are, are the least sensitive. So, you know, 30 years ago, in order to diagnose RSV, you actually had to be able to collect a respiratory sample like sputum and, and try to culture the virus. And you would only find it if the person really had RSV about a third of the time, which is just a, an incredibly insensitive test. Um, and also virus viral cultures are just really hard to do. We don't really have that expertise anymore because they... Right obviously difficult. And then in the 80s and 90s, antigen-based tests were developed, which are really great point of care, rapid tests that you can do in your office. And they're quick, they're easy, they have really good performance in young children. In fact, you know, the sensitivity is, is about 90% in young children because they have a lot of virus. And so you'll, you'll detect it. But we've shown that in older children and adults for whom the amount of virus they might have in their nose is, is maybe a little bit lower, and they're shedding virus for a shorter duration of period, antigen-based tests are actually sometimes in some cases less than 70% sensitive. So not a great test, um, which is sad because it's so easy to do and so widely and readily available in most primary care practices. So how we diagnose RSV in adults is we have to use um, a PCR-based test. So a molecular assay where you're looking for the genetic material of the virus. And in fact, that's become the gold standard because it's 95% or better sensitive for all ages. It's usually duplex with flu. So for most hospitals that do PCR testing for flu, that's sort of linked and duplex with a test for RSV. So you're actually getting two for the price of one, but most people don't even know that. And the, and the uh, uh, results are often available within an hour. Has the emergence of COVID-19 changed the diagnosis and treatment of RSV? And if, if so, how? Um, well, there, there are no treatments for RSV. And part of the reason is because by the time we detect it, there, it's, the giving an antiviral is not going to make a difference. But I think the impact of COVID has taught us that it's important to make viral diagnoses as early as possible because the earlier you can intervene in somebody that has a virus, whether it's COVID or flu or RSV, the better your chances are of preventing that person to go on and have some more severe disease. And so if there was ever a chance to develop a successful antiviral in RSV, it's really going to take a paradigm shift. Um, and people really, and practitioners really um, working hard to make diagnoses of RSV so that you can get them treatment really early. And I think COVID in general has just raised the awareness of how um, older adults are very vulnerable to viral infections. And so I think having that awareness will be a good starting point for the educational initiatives we're going to have to um, put in place to help people understand the impact of RSV. Have you seen a decline in the cases of RSV during the COVID pandemic? Yeah, it was really strange. Um, well, not really. It just sort of makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, everybody was masking up. And so for the 2019-2020 um, and 2020 and 2021 um, winter seasons, which is when you usually see things like flu and RSV, um, mm -hmm. they both pretty much disappeared. It was great. <laughs> it was right, such lesson, right. <laughs> such a like a, such a lesson on what mitigation strategies can do when people actually wash their hands and wear masks and cover their coughs. Right. Um, but then we had this weird spike of RSV in the summer, um, mm -hmm. which nobody would have predicted because you know dogma has always said you know these viruses really only circulate. Um, in the winter seasons, when people are crowded indoors, you know, cold weather is better for viruses. And so it sort of has turned everything we know about seasonality of these viruses upside down. Yeah, I find it interesting that it, it, I think it is also possible that there probably were some RSV cases that maybe were masked as COVID or could that have happened? What do you think? It depends on where they 
when they had those symptoms, where they went to be tested. Okay. Um, it's possible, like in the state of New York, if you had a respiratory illness and you went to get tested, the state of New York was requiring most institutions to test, not just for COVID, but for RSV and influenza as well. So a lot of data was showing that there just wasn't any RSV or flu around. So, um, okay. but that's not true for the whole country or, or even the whole world. You kind of hit on my next question, but I, but I want to go ahead and um, ask it. Um, can we discuss the precautions taken to contain RSV once a patient has been diagnosed? Well, it depends on what setting you're talking about. If it's in the outpatient setting, um, very often RSV in a household or in a family group or in a social setting starts with kids. Um, kids are just a natural reservoir for viruses and they have lots of secretions and they love to spread those around. And so um, if you know your child is infected with RSV, the best thing to do is to keep them away from their older, more vulnerable relatives, um, because there's just no way of, of cleaning them or keeping their secretions and, and wiping their noses well enough that you're not going to be able to put other people at risk for, for contracting RSV. If it's, a, you know, if you're a mom or a dad of a kid that had RSV and now you have it then a lot of the typical precautions that we put in place for COVID should apply to you. You know, wash your hands, cover your mouth when you cough. And if you're in the hospital, because RSV is transmitted by both respiratory droplets and also to a larger extent than COVID by contact with patients, with their secretions and with surfaces, um, they are, we, for patients who are in the hospital that have RSV, they have both droplets, which means you wear a surgical mask, as well as standard precautions, which means you glove, um, sometimes you wear gowns, um, and then you wash your hands a lot. Once the RSV vaccine is approved, would you recommend it to patients? And is there a specific patient population that should get it? And will the availability of an RSV vaccine change how the disease is viewed and treated? Yeah, I think um, for a number of decades now, um, as a medical community, we've been working to develop vaccines for RSV. It's an important vaccine to have both for young children, because uh, there's still a lot of children around the world that die from RSV every year. And it's also an important vaccine in adults over the age of 65. Um, older adults who tend to have more severe disease, particularly those with underlying cardiopulmonary conditions. So I think that I, I would recommend the vaccine once approved in those populations. I think it will be some Something that we really have to do a lot of education about. And, you know, I think it's it's sort of thinking about what can we do to prevent pneumonia, which we know is really devastating in all older adults. And this is, you know, one of the biggest causes of it in this population. In general, how has the COVID-19 pandemic changed views towards testing and surveillance of infectious diseases? Well, I think people are really aware of their vulnerability. Um, you know, we're all vulnerable to COVID, um, but I think it's just made people more aware that there are viruses that can cause you to be very sick. It's not just influenza. It's not something that you can give antibiotics for. And that the answer with many viruses is really about prevention. So I think the COVID pandemic has really put prevention of respiratory viral illnesses at, at the forefront of, of people's minds um, in the medical community and in, in the general population. So I think in general, people will be thinking, well, how do we prevent these illnesses? How can I protect myself? And I think that will maybe lead to some greater acceptance of an RSV vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Branch, for joining us on the On Medical Grounds podcast. We appreciate you educating our audience on RSV and the elderly and the importance of proper testing and diagnosis. Okay, thank you very much for having me. And thank you for listening to the On Medical Grounds podcast. We know your time is valuable. The resources that were referred to in this podcast can be found at onmedicalgrounds.com. In addition, please be sure to click the subscribe button to be alerted when we post new content. 